Welcome to lecture one on Texas interest groups and lobbying. Interest groups matter because they provide support for existing policies, but more importantly, they also challenge some policies and advocate for changes to others. In other words, interest groups can be agents for change. To accomplish this goal, interest groups will do a variety of activities. They will either support legislatures in their electoral campaign campaigns or they will articulate ideas from which policies can be crafted and are mobilized to challenge the ideas and interests of others. In sum, interest groups play an important role in elections and the legislative process in Texas. So what is an interest group? An interest group is an organization that seeks to influence government policies and programs. Interest groups assume a variety of forms and they can be set up to serve small or large numbers of members. They can serve either the public interest like environmental or education or their memberships interests like labor unions. Interest groups strategies to influence the government are largely determined by the resources that they can command. These resources come from the membership of the interest groups in the form of monetary fees or donation. Membership matters in that groups with a lot of members will consequently have more money and have more electoral influence. However, smaller groups with a few large benefactors can also achieve success in influencing the government. Besides money, credible information on their desired policy aims is significant and it's an influential currency in shaping government actions. These two resources, money and information, are the foundation upon which strategies are developed to promote an interest group's concerns. Ultimately, information must be credible for it to have any influence on the democratic process. The right to associate with others and to petition the government is guaranteed by the United States and the Texas Constitution. The United States is what is known as a pluralist democracy in which groups can organize and compete for power and influence over the government. The idea behind pluralism is that if all groups are allowed to compete for this influence, then the result will be moderation and compromise. When a group is denied this ability, they will eventually become radicalized and extreme. The largest problem that interest groups face is the collective action dilemma and the free rider problem. Essentially, if one can benefit from the collective good that results from the interest group action without joining or participating with the group, then logic dictates that most people will not join. Think of clean air and the environmental groups that have lobbied the government over the years. Clean air is a collective good. It cannot be denied for those who did not participate in the environmental group's activities. So how do these groups convince potential members to donate the time and money and effort to a group if they can realize the benefit without joining? Interest groups employ various strategies to overcome free riding and mainly many offer selective benefits for group members. Selective benefits come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, basically, if you join our group, we'll get you discounts on FedEx packages or something like that, or we'll give you a t-shirt, we'll give you information that not everybody has, you'll have access to this newsletter, or you can go to conferences, or you'll be part of something, you're helping to save the planet. These are all different types of selective benefits, and I believe the textbook you know, goes a little bit more in depth on this. Now, interest groups want policies that benefit their membership or achieve their goals. In turn, the policymakers themselves benefit from interest groups because they can provide policy expertise. They can contribute campaign funds. They can mobilize their voters to support their candidates. They can provide campaign workers, run advertisements, etc., etc. 
So well-funded interest groups have an advantage in affecting the policy process because they have continuity. They are continuously present in Austin and they develop long-lasting relationships with policymakers. These interest groups strive to influence public opinion. They strive to present their views to policymakers and support policymakers who are friendly to their cause. To this end, interest groups use professional lobbyists to try to influence governmental decisions on their behalf. All lobbyists must be able to reach and communicate with policymakers, so access is key for any lobbyist. Without it, they don't have any influence. Interest groups strive to influence public opinion. They take their views to policymakers and support policymakers who are friendly to their causes. Interest groups use lobbyists to try to influence the governmental decisions on their behalf. All lobbyists must be able to reach and communicate with policymakers. Now, some interest groups focus on a single issue, while others are concerned with multiple issues that affect their membership. Corporations are also considered interest groups. Interest groups may represent professional groups such as the Texas Medical Association or the, uh, you know, the bar, the lawyers associations. Uh, but public employee interest groups include things like public school teachers. Civil rights groups such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People or the NAACP and the League of United Latin American Citizens or LULAC have had notable success using litigation to advance their policy objectives. We will stop there with lecture one.